All right, I wanna thank everyone for coming out and joining us with the Asian American Chamber of Commerce um, from wherever you are uh, and welcoming us, welcoming us into your home office or wherever you may be, because I see one person is actually driving. Um, today we have our fireside chat. We have three amazing people uh, that are with us today. Uh, I'm gonna sit there and just ask you folks just a few questions. And one of them, I, I have a prop for this one. You'll love it. Hang on. Props <laughs> should be very quick. Welcome to my elevator. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I always hear about is you always have to have a elevator pitch or some short concept of who you are in your business and what you want and depending on who you're talking to. So just for example, you met me, I'm in the elevator and what's your elevator pitch? Just, I'm just curious. <laughs> Start off with Ken. Sure, pick on me first or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm president of Mobomo. Mobomo is a digital transformation company, primarily for federal governments. So we help federal governments develop their web and mobile presence and connect with their customers. Um, some of the customers that we have that you would know about is, you know, NASA, we do their websites so NASA.gov, USA.gov, USGS.gov, FERC.gov, Voice of America. So any sort of flagship um, digital property is, is usually what we basically build out. Flabby. Hi, I'm Pali B. I'm the CEO of Harmonia Holdings Group. We are a federal contractor and it's usually hard for a federal contractor to have an elevator pitch because we all do the same thing. We deal in bodies in a way. But Harmonia is unique because we had our origins in the world of small business innovative research contracts. We worked on 90 of them. So we came out of the world of research and development and we bring this to all our other civilian contra federal agencies. Uh, we work across almost all of the federal uh, agencies and almost all of DOD building uh, technology services in artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, big data, blockchain, name it, innovation and technology delivery is what we come with. And for that, we've been recognized with the Tibbetts Award, which is an award for bringing innovation to actual commercial use. And we are one of the rare companies, if not the only company in the country to have won the Tibbetts Award thrice and once at the White House. Great, and Songwei. Okay, I'm Songwei Tao from Wares Inc. Uh, uh, Wares is a small business, uh, also a government contract. We primarily focusing on transportation consulting, like the highway transportation. So our clients include the DOT at the federal and the state level. Um, so in terms of the elevate uh, pitch, I would say uh, we'll use data to help make you become smarter. I like that. <laughs> I so, so just so you know, my, my, my elevator pitch is a little different because I, I normally try to help folks resolve contracting issues. So normally when I hop in an elevator, my first line is, can you believe what just happened? Did you hear? <laughs> And people will normally start talking about, oh, how did you know that? And then they'll tell me what's going on. And that's that's my data collection, but don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Um, so one of the things I, I've always been fascinated with is how people select the identity. So how did you come up with your name? And this time I'm gonna start with uh, Pallavi. How, how did you pick the company name? So the company name came from, we, our first product was UIML, which was Unified Markup Language, which tried to create harmony between humans and computer interfaces. And from there came the name Harmonia. So it's basically making it easier to interact with every aspect of uh, development of technology. Um, so we just had a quiz in our company, ask our employee what the words means. <laughs> so <laughs> sorry, yeah, it's like, we just had that quiz last week. Like, so words means like, uh, you know, it's the, the letter of uh, my family members, like, uh, you know, my love, my first name, and uh, then, you know, my wife, my daughter's, uh, you know, first name, initial. 
So we put together the wireless school. And uh, it's really good because, you know, as doing business, it's not, it's not easy. Like uh, but when you think about the, the company name, it reminds you the family, the strengths behind that. So that's good. So I'm very glad to have this name. Thank you. Ken. So Mobomo came about because there was no American word like that included the word mobile. <laughs> so you have to come up that you can get a domain name for. So you had to come up with something. Um, and so I'm lucky in that I didn't come up with the name because nobody can pronounce it. Uh, so our founder, Barga Bender, um, you know, basically came up with the name uh, and it was based off of, he was in South America on an avocado farm, which was also where the hummingbird icon comes from. Um, because the hummingbird is like nimble and agile and all this kind of stuff or whatever. So Mobomo is like some river or something like that in, in South America. And he's like, mobile, Mobomo, like, yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Nice. <laughs> but now everybody has to mumble our names and, you know, once they get up to speak. <laughs> I, I've actually thrown the syllables backwards because I think I had it as, as mo, 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 or something. <laughs> So, so actually the funniest thing, and you guys can look it up, but there is a, a Silicon Valley episode, right? Where, you know, they get up on TechCrunch and like, it's all the pitches, right? And at the time, you know, it, everything is social, mobile, local, local, right? Like those are like the buzzwords. And they literally like through the thing, like they start cutting in and it's like, we're so mo low, low mo so like, you know, and then we have a, you know, we have the joke and we end it. It's like, it's mo bummo. Right? Nice. <laughs> so anyway, long story. Not so one of the interesting, so one of the interesting thing is, is I've, I've known you all for a little while. Ken, I think I've known you the longest and I really don't know a lot about you folks. And, and it's kind of interesting because I was thinking about it. And, and I play a lot of golf. And I used to play golf with this group called the Washington Duffers. And from April all the way through November, every other Sunday, we play together. And I used to play golf with this guy named Tony. And I really, I mean, I knew his family. I knew a lot about him. But I didn't know a lot until one day I went to this Asian gala, award gala. And, and uh, Tony was there. And he's all dressed up in uniform. And I'm like, do you need help? And he goes, Stan, it's me, Tony. Shortly after, the, uh, the, the MC sat there and announced, and now for our keynote speaker, Major General Antonio Taguba. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's amazing how you can know someone and not really know them. So I, I just want to go into kind of getting to know you better. And that really comes out to how do you balance business and family life? Who are we starting with? I'll start with you. <laughs> <laughs> In a big mouth. <laughs> serves, serves you right. <laughs> I know, serves me right. It's, it's, it was easy, for, you know, when you're in the technology industry, because a woman has unique challenges, right? Being a mother and still, and my mother stays with me, who's really old. But being in the technology sector, since a lot of our work, except for meetings, when you're really meeting clients, can be done remotely. Um, I think uh, our industry allows for a lot of flexibility. I had, as a business owner, like all of you, long, long, long hours, but I could adjust it so that I was there for my daughter when she came back from school at three and I'd spend an hour and then she'd be busy and then we could have dinner together and then I could be up the whole night and it didn't matter because when she went to school, I could catch up on sleep if I was working on a proposal. So I think just the industry allowed me to really create a wonderful balance and be all things that I wanted to be at every stage of my life. And Songwei. So... When I started the business in 2006, um, I have two daughters. Uh, at that time, 2006, my old daughter was uh, eight years old. My younger one was uh, three years old. So right now, is the old one is already graduated from the college. The younger one is at the senior of the high school. So kind of like I feel like uh, you know I went through the whole you know their elementary, middle school, and high school. Um, I was very happy, like I didn't miss that, you know, part. Um, although it was tough, like you have to balance between work and life. But uh, overall, I feel, um, I feel I'm very fortunate to be, you know, during that, you know, that process. 
I think the way to balance family in the life is uh, is just like uh, you know a lot of time you give priority, you know things you have to do with them first, and then when they go to sleep, like uh, that's the time you work. Mm-hmm. Probably say you know, so uh, that's the only way uh, you know most time like that's how you know uh, how we did it. Thanks, Ken. So uh, for me, it did, you know, like um, gotten much better. In the beginning, I think it was it was pretty tough because I had when I first started, um, actually my first company, a company called Altum. Um, that's when I actually had my my first son, my first child, and and so the balance was kind of weird, just because like I enjoy what I do, right, and so work as everybody mentioned, like, especially when you're a business owner is, is pretty much 24 seven. Right. Um, so there were definitely days where, you know, like I'd get home and then I'd say like, Oh, I just need to go to my office and kick off something. Right. That was apparently like the famous word from my wife was like, okay, he's going to go kick off something. (laughs) Meaning I'd started program or job or something like that or whatever. But then all of a sudden I, she'd not see me. (laughs) So, so over time we did get to this rule of like, look, you know what I mean? Like when you come home, right, you're home. And if you're on the phone or if you're like, you know, working or whatever it may be, because there's obviously a lot of stuff that happens even in the car, right? Like you're on conference calls or whatever. She's like, then you stay outside. You don't walk in the house, like with the phone and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. Because like when you're home, like the kids are expecting you home, right? And so we did end up setting up this time where she's like, you know, like basically we came up with this idea of like from six to nine, right? Mm-hmm. You're home. You know what I mean? Unless, you know, obviously things come up or whatever, right? So, but from six to nine, you're home and it's three hours, right? And you think to yourself, like three hours to spend with your kids or whatever, like, you know what I mean? It's really not that much time, but all of a sudden, like, you know, hey, you're a good father. and all. <laughs> So that was basically the rule. And it took us a little while to kind of get into that, you know, routine or whatever, um, you know, but that's basically, you know, kind of what, what happened. Now, as the kids got older, like now all my kids are in college and all this kind of stuff or whatever, um, as Palabi had mentioned, you know, it is, it is pretty nice to be in digital because what I've, what I've worked into is that like work and life actually are balanced in the fact that I give priority to kind of the personal things as, as well as the business thing. So I just weave that in, you know what I mean? So the nice thing is because of the fact that, you know, like, I feel like the currency is time right? Like that should be the most valuable thing. Then you can say like, oh, I have to go see my kids thing from one to three. That's a meeting. You know what I mean? Or I have to do this or this personal thing or whatever. But that means that also like, you know, as was mentioned, like nine o'clock at night, I might have a call. You Mm -hmm. know what I mean? Because that's what's convenient for some of the other managers or whatever it is kind of thing. So it all just becomes kind of, kind of life. You know what I mean? And it's, I think that's actually helped me and probably has helped the other, you know, some of the other um, CEOs in, during this COVID time because it wasn't that big of a shift, right? Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I do know, like, you know, for a lot of our employees and stuff like that, not having an office to go to, not having that set schedule and all this kind of stuff or whatever, it does make it very difficult to separate it kind of home, you know, from. But I've been doing this for years, and now, you know, that balance. But but it did. I didn't. I wanted to make sure that people know that it took some time. <laughs> So being a former, being a former Fed, I wanted to let you know that I checked out all your websites <laughs> and, and I'm going to, I'm going to test Boy. your knowledge of your website. Um, one of them, I believe it's the mission and it's, we think big, we thrive on the impossible, embrace the insurmountable and defy expectations at every turn. Explain why was that important to you? Believe it or not. I believe that was Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Say that one more time. <laughs> You're all pondering that one. <laughs> Should have prepped you. We think big. We th- thrive on the impossible. Embrace the insurmountable. And defy expectations at every turn. Okay. So, yeah. I have that, that wrong. Comes- What's that song, ways? <laughs> Pardon? 
or do I have that wrong? And that was somebody else's. No, that sounds like us, not exactly like ours or whatever. We do have a, what we call our uh, Movomo code. It's our brand book or whatever. Um, and so it's interesting, um, you know, if you go to our press kit or whatever, it's called push, right? And then we have eight tenants or whatever. So it does sound, it's not exactly, I thought we had something like, you know, anyway. Um, but it was interesting because we had, we did have a consultant kind of come in and um, come up with kind of the Mobomo, like I said, code of, of what we stand for and all this kind of stuff. And the interesting thing about it is they actually interviewed everybody in the company you know what i mean and basically embodied that in into the into the book right of like these values and all this kind of stuff so i mean mobomo like so that that is the the more the word that you know i don't know where our marketing went with that or whatever because that was years ago um but the the word push is definitely you know what Mobomo kind of stands for. And if you talk to our founder, Barg or whatever, he loves to basically say, look, we'll, we'll build anything on the planet. You know what I mean? Um, and so our, our uh, team um, does, I mean, we, we're all about shipping product, right? And so when we take on a, a, a project like NASA or Voice of America, or, you know, it's all about like, how do we ship that product, right? It's not as much about, you know, as, as we talked about, like, don't get me wrong, we probably need to do a better job at this, but a lot of government contracting is somewhat staff augmentation, right? They're looking for like 12, Java, you know, or an agile team or whatever. Like, mm, Mobile is really more about like, we're gonna build something and we're gonna launch it. You know what I mean? And that's really like our core competency. So a lot of times they'll, you know, agencies come to us because they're like, oh, we have this legacy system or we have this new innovation need, blah, 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 whatever, you know, can you build it for us, right? And we do that for commercial companies too. Usually it's a situation where they're like, hey, you know, we have this business, blah, blah, blah. We don't know mobile or we don't know Alexa. Or we don't know like, you know, like, can you build it for us or build us a platform? And so, so that, that's really what Mobomo is. So that's probably where some of that language comes from of doing the impossible. Like that really, you know, drives our people now. On the flip side, just again, you know, we're in, I guess, the safe space of like government contracting, AACC or whatever. Like, from my standpoint, you know, the problem is, is then the ninjas that like to do the impossible and launch this kind of stuff, the last thing that they want to do is operations and maintenance of that system. Right. <laughs> right? So, so we actually have a little bit of a harder time, like, because, you know, case study. We took over this NASA.gov. We had to basically rebuild their um, content management system from the ground up and do it as quickly as possible because there was, they were transferring from a proprietary system and it was costing them half a million dollars a month to run that thing, right? So they're like, get us out of there as quickly as possible, right? So we basically rebuilt it and launched it in 13 weeks, right? And then the agency is like, hey, thanks very much. Like, okay, now we're gonna transfer it over to this contractor for operations and maintenance because they're the ones that do. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so we do have to get better at that because it is a different group. Like, so that transfer of like, hey, the folks that are gonna build and launch, and then how do you transfer that over to operations and maintenance, which is more like keeping the lights on and keeping it updated and all that kind of stuff. Um, so. No, I like that. And, and I, I really, I looked at that statement. I kind of thought, oh, yeah, it kind of sounds like Ken. <laughs> look, look, looking at what needs to be changed and, and trying to figure out how to resolve those issues. Um, so, so that was pretty good. Um, so I found another one. I, I, I really love this one. Um, having fun and challenging times. Another statement was solid company, great growth, emerging gem. Uh, very welcoming, great rewards, and wonderful people. Those are three different quotes from three different people. It's on a scrolling portion of the website, and it's kind of like an affidavit of what the company is. And you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it's me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but, you know, we started, all of us Asians, right, come from a very family-oriented view to life. Family is very important. And when I started Harmonia, 
I had just had my daughter after nine years of trying. So I wanted, I wanted, nobody wanted to hire me because with my skill sets, they wanted me to travel and I did not want to travel. So I started Harmonia because that would give me the flexibility to be a mother and yet to be a career woman. And we had two employees and they were like my children. They were college students, right? So we, and Harmonia grew one by one by one from a two person company to now a 400 person company. But I was learning to be a mother and I'd practice at work and I'd practice at home. So everybody became family to me, right? So we've kept that culture. I remember our first holiday party. I was like, we were what all of my six people by then. And we said, call your grandmother, call your mother, call your neighbor, call anybody so that we can fill a room. And for years, all our holiday parties and all our events were like, everybody in the family comes. We are one family oriented company. And now when we are no longer small, we are other than small. We've managed to keep that culture. And I think people love it because in a lot of bigger companies, it's a body count, right? Everybody becomes just a number. And we have historically stayed away from that. And if you can keep your people like your family and they're loyal, and especially in government contracting, when your contract is up for rebid, they'll try to poach your employees and employees know everything. So if they go to a competitor, they take all your recipes with them. So keeping your employees happy and committed is the only way one can grow, in my opinion, and stay and repeat the same customers again and again um, in this space. And that's been our secret sauce. And I think that's why you see all those comments out there about you know the good things. <laughs> that's beautiful. Um, so the final one, I guess you know who you are. And it basically <laughs> said that the company is small, flexible company focused on developing client-based solutions um, in a customer's centric context. And uh, I was actually gonna pick another part from your website, but it got a little bit more technical than I wanted to try to pronounce. <laughs> but but I, love, I love the fact that your website expresses who you are and the technology that you're in. So, so I'll let you talk sort of about that, but also um, about being a small business itself and in the environment that you're in. Sure. Um... I think I first I would say like uh, you know I would share everything you know probably and I can say as a business owner as a company how you build a company how you how you really you know place your value proposition you know in your business so from you know where is you know side is uh, you know of course like business owner you are always the first one started and uh, the way I started is I just had a passion like to try to solve something I'm interested. In. You know, I want to find a solution for that. And uh, I not only just want to find a solution, I want to find some solution that nobody has done that before. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why innovation is very critical. And uh, I just don't want to follow, you know, a lot of solutions proven. Yes, it's proven great, but I want to find something. There must, you know, the world is, uh, is, is challenging. The world is complex. Is, uh, you can always find something interesting, innovative to do. So that's a kind of like a study that, you know, how we started, you know, as a company, we want to find something, you know, challenging, innovative, but it's interesting to do. And uh, so that's how we started. That's how we got the, you know, you know, folks joining our company, really try to come up with, you know, innovative ways to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the project we did is dynamic pricing on I-66. Uh, you, some of you already know that. It was challenging, you know, nobody has done that before. You know, a lot of, you know, new idea, new thoughts, you know, but we we took on it and we tried, we gave our best shot. And uh, and uh, during that process, we learned and uh, we build the relationship with the different parties and we grow and uh, stronger. So that's what we really happy that we really, you know, kind of feel like we really got a lot of out of that process. Um, so that's, really one of the funding you know, blocks of the company. I, I think it's really neat that, I know, I know a lot of firms that do analytics and then they provide mm -hmm. their studies or research and all the data, um, and then they try to come up with solutions, but you're actually implementing mm -hmm. the solution itself and, and like the I-66 corridor with the toll roads and everything. I mean, trying to, trying to figure out traffic flow and, yeah. and, and all that wonderful stuff that goes into <laughs> how do you keep a mechanism moving with the limited resources, which the resources is the lanes compared to the amount of cars and everything going on and how do you keep flow moving? Right. 
um, that's that's that takes a lot. So I commend you on that. Thank you. Um, one of the things that 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 kind of leads up to is we're we're currently in a pandemic, obviously, because we're on Zoom instead of face to face. Um, how how has that and to any of you, how has that impacted um, your company, if at all? Because I, I believe some of you already had folks that may have been either offsite or teleworking already. So I can take a shot at that. Uh, we had we work across several federal agencies, and some agencies allow telecommute, especially in our uh, research projects for the Department of Defense. Uh, the offices are in controlment areas, right? So we, a lot of our employees have the flexibility of coming into our local office or working from home. That wasn't an issue, but for certain clients like the Census Bureau, which is about one of our largest clients, we handle a lot of Title 13 and Title 26 data. So they, the question of them doing any work remotely did not arise. So a lot of times people at the Census Bureau who worked, my employees were like, can you put me on a different project because I'd like at least one day of telecommute, especially those in Northern Virginia because traffic is hard. And it was like, no, I, I need people here and you can telecommute. And it was very hard to balance the company. But with the pandemic, the blessing that came, within a week, all of my census work became remote. That was 156 people working remote on Title 13, Title 26 data, and the infrastructure was put in place. So that was really a game changer for our employees. And I think going forward, nobody is going to go back to a world, especially in populated areas like Northern Virginia, where traffic is an issue, where we are working five days remotely. So that part was a plus. On the other hand, I think God was really kind. Being a federal contractor, none of our work, knock on wood to date, was interrupted. So we, as a company, didn't see any loss whatsoever in dollars. And we chose that. And as a company, we had several town hall meetings to decide how can we give back. And as a company, we decided we can help our local restaurants because those are really hard hit, right? So we, we did a program via Grubhub where we gave each employee $40 a week to order from their favorite restaurant, which wasn't a chain restaurant, because chains can still survive, but it's a small mom and pop shops which can. And we've done that uh, for a large part during the pandemic every week. So the employees benefited. The company didn't have, we, we do a lot of events for the employees. So we didn't have that expense. We took that expense, gave it to the employee who had a treat once a week, stayed connected, and it helped a local restaurant. We also started a food service uh, where we would, uh, um, there's a truck which goes to DC to feed the homeless and the school children who were not getting meals. And we picked up Tuesdays as the day to sponsor that truck. So as a whole, and we did it as a family of the whole Harmonia company, and we did it in all our neighborhoods where Harmonia was. So it, it created a giving back and a bonding within the company. So I think the pandemic didn't hurt us fiscally and it made us more socially responsible and created a bonding. So it was positive. Um, it you know, when they say life gives you lemon, you make a lemonade. So we really managed to kind of do that. So from our company perspective, is, uh, I would say like, uh, um, you know, since March, I think that started in March, like at the beginning of the March, you know, for the last uh, six months, I think the company is kind of also evolving in our position, you know, because we kind of know the situation better and better. You know, at the beginning, I would say in March, uh, it was a lot of uncertainty there. You know, we never had that before. You know, you know, we all work from home at that time. You know, fortunately, like we will, the work we do all can be done from home. So we immediately let everybody stay home to work from there. But people still at that time, you know, Lot of anxiety how these things going to play out in the how long so we had a lot of uh, town hall meetings you know really to you know make a bond you know you know to really stay connected with our employees to really you know make sure that they they're not only just do the work they are mentally they feel safe mm -hmm. they feel you know comfortable they feel connected they can talk to so that was a lot you know kind of the first priority first uh, i would say in march and april that time. When we got into the summer, things started getting a little calm down, you know. At that time, we, you know, really company kind of start to really think of ways to give them back to the community at that time. You know, like I'm saying is we also did some, you know, restaurant support work. That was the, you know, um, 
you know, the most hit, you know, hard like, uh, you know, place. So we kind of have similar program, you know, company, you know, let employee to donate, you know, uh, to that local restaurant to help. And we also had some other programs. Um, so that's still going on right now. And uh, when we get into the holiday, you know, season and Thanksgiving time. So, and then on the other aspect, you know, you know, as a small business, it's really a challenge to the small business. Through this process, we, I actually feel our company is, uh, is getting stronger uh, in a way is because, you know, the tough the situation, how you react, it's really make you, you know, um, stronger. So for example, the first few months we have daily, we had a daily you know, like a stand up call, you know, every day, all the leads, you know, just checking hey, everybody is safe, is good and stay connected. So after that, after a couple of months, we started like uh, not daily call anymore, just every couple of days, you know, we had a call. And then right now is uh, we only have weekly call, you know, because the reason is everybody connected and also the process is in place. And uh, um, so things are really, you know, uh, calmed down and uh, people are really knows what to do at this time. The leads, the manager, they know what's the channel to communicate. So I want to say like through this process, the company like small business like us is also, you know, it's challenging, but it's also give us the opportunity, you know, to face the challenge to grow strong. Yeah, we, um, you know, we had a pretty similar uh, experience or whatever. So, you know, I think um, all three companies are obviously fortunate uh, to be in digital services, right? Um, Mobomo had always been in, you know, kind of application modernization. Um, so most of our work is in the cloud. We have very few, you know, kind of physical infrastructure pieces. We do have some contracts that still have legacy systems on physical that, you know, some of our people have to go, you know, every now and then if they have to touch a server or whatever. Um, but we were able to, same thing, go, go completely remote. I think it was like March 13th, just shut down the offices and, and basically everybody worked from home. We were lucky that, you know, from our standpoint, because of the work that we do and also the fact that we're global, we have offices in, in India and in, in uh, uh, Buenos Aires, um, that we, you know, all of our stuff was ready for that anyway. Uh, we did see a pause um, as some of our, our government clients, like we actually had to delay some launches and stuff like that because, you know, they were getting their telework. Uh, folks. So Voice of America in particular, I mean, they do like basically broadcast news, right? So they have studios and all this kind of stuff. So they were trying to figure out like, how do I, how do I move this operation out? You know what I mean? Um, so there was a little bit of a pause there, but then, you know, business kind of continued. And if anything, you know, being in the federal government, because it is a public health concern, it is a, you know, emergency kind of response. Um, we actually did get some additional funding from the v veteran affairs, which was COVID funding, right? To get some of the uh, mobile applications out to veterans since they can't go into clinics anymore and stuff like that, right? On the flip side, because we do do some commercial, you know, we, we have some, you know, retail, um, uh, luxury spa, like uh, gyms, stuff like that or whatever, that those, those contracts ended. You know what I mean? Because they're, they're not open. Um, and so those, you know, are a little bit harder. Some of them have actually turned into opportunities where it's like, okay, well, we, we have to go digital now, right? Like, so how do we, how do we provide like an app that will allow you to check in, check out so that, you know, we can maintain social distancing and there's only so many people you know, in the gym or like, can we do like, you know, kind of virtual, like, you know, exercise, blah, 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 whatever, you know what I mean? But some of them, you know, basically they're like, you know, they'll, they'll pull the contract and like, look, uh, we have no more customers. We have no more revenue. So, um, so some of our contracts closed on the, on the commercial side. A little bit different question uh, without getting into personal, personal, political beliefs or any of that, every four years, we go through <laughs> somewhat of a political change. Um, presidents can serve two year term or two, two terms for eight years. But even when they 
change into the second term of their administration, a lot of the players change. So the question is, is we're going into a new, a new era where in 2021, we'll have an administrative change. Um, how, how does that impact your company and how being in sort of the DC area um, where, where a lot of federal agencies are, how, how do you then do your game plan on, on keeping business and marketing your company? Or, or is there a difference? I can take a shot at that first. Um, a lot of companies I've seen in our space will focus on a particular agency. A dear friend of mine just focused on NIH and he had a wonderful exit, right? Um, early on, from very early on, um, this is my third business. My second business went bankrupt. The first business was kind of okay. So I became, uh, avoiding risk became paramount in my business strategy. So when we got into federal contracting, we figured, you know, exactly this. Four years later, the government might have a priority on defense. Another four years later, it might be green. I remember in the Obama era, I was sitting in Department of Energy doing a kickoff meeting for one of the contracts we'd won. And my technical monitor said, I can only give you three minutes of that one hour meeting because we've been instructed to figure out how to spend 180 million and we have to give a plan by 5 p.m., right? So <laughs> as the agents, as the leadership changes, priorities change and one agency might have funding and the other may not in the next time. So Harmonia went very diverse. So we, like I said earlier, we cover almost all of DOD and almost all the federal agencies just to hedge that bet, right? Uh, we were first initially only on DOD and I saw, you know, shifting priorities and that did catch us off guard. So we've, we've learned to, you know, balance our portfolio, just like we invest our money and, in, you know, all kinds of, uh, companies and high risk and low risk. We do the same when it comes to the kind of agencies and contracts we work with. Because you're right, shifting priorities may put a business out of uh, business. Yeah, I worked, I worked at a federal agency and, and when I worked at a district office out in the West Coast, changing in administrations really didn't impact us as much. As I went to the DC office, I noticed there was a lot more a lot more awareness of what was going on, um, how political things, the environment, mainly because they were dealing with agencies that were here. And then when I went to headquarters, um, there, everything from working with the administrator and all of the political appointees suddenly changing, there was much more dramatic. But I noticed when you went further away and you're on the West Coast, it, it, it was less of an impact from some regards because you're not seeing people face to face more on a more current basis. It's more of a person on a telephone. Um, today's environment's a little bit different because it doesn't matter where you are because Zoom and other programs that are out there. Um, did you guys have anything to add? Yeah, from our, our, my perspective or whatever, it's never, um, it's not necessarily red or blue, to be honest with you. I mean, I think there are obviously are shifting things and all that kind of stuff and, and the priorities change based upon the administration, but like any administration change, in general will change the priorities of, you know, of an agency. And sometimes, I mean, I think, you know, we're, we're fortunate in that once again, you know, everybody still needs, you know, websites and mobile apps and like, you know, systems and all that kind of stuff. And it's not easy to like necessarily change those overnight or whatever. Um, so a lot of times an administration change, you know, the difficulties are like, you know, just at this point in time, you know, from a budgetary perspective and from like kind of a contract perspective, like we're going to move into a continuing resolution, right? So uh, there's not going to be any new. So every four years, I can tell you that at this point in time, like our company is always prepared for basically like, you know, you got to ink your contracts or any sort of extensions or whatever it is like, you know, that, that had to happen in July, August. Right. Like, and now we're going to be coasting until the new administration comes in and priority is set because nobody's going to make any decisions, mm -hmm. you know, on an administration. They're like, well, I don't know. I, I don't know what the administration's new priorities are going to be. Right. So, so from a government contracting standpoint, I think that our businesses have learned that, you know, during this, an administration change, like the months leading up to that, most likely big buy decisions or big initiatives are not going to be made because nobody's going to start something right before an administration change. 
I think that's the biggest thing. Like I said, it's not necessarily red or blue. Some of our agencies, as Pallavi had mentioned, is, you know, are very politically charged. You know what I mean? So I can tell you that Voice of America just, you know, was appointed a new Trump pointy that took like two years for him to get in. And, you know, once he got in, like basically all, all of the senior management is gone. Like they either resigned or they, you mm -hmm. know, and, and so, so that, that more you know, is more the cases as opposed to, you know what I mean, necessarily. So, you know, but then there's a lot of agencies that are just, you know, we're, we're too low down on the totem pole that it matters. <laughs> so we don't really get affected. Yeah. I think to all uh, company, I uh, don't really feel direct impact. Um, part of the reason is you know, we are still, you know, most of our revenue are still relying on the government, like, uh, you know, set aside for small business. So that, that policy is still very consistent. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, the government, the federal government always encourages small business. So they have, you know, that percentage of funding for small business is still very, you know, very stable. And then on the other aspect is, you know, most of the, some of the projects we do are transportation related. So that's a kind of a recognized issue in the nation is that we have an aged transportation infrastructure we need to improve. So from our perspective, I don't see, you know, a very, you know, direct impact, you know, at this time. So, so one of the interesting things that I always get asked is how do I break into the marketplace? I mean, whether it's federal marketplace or commercial side, could be state or county, um, could be could be a hybrid. I mean, like some of the work that you do, Sangwe, is is probably funded through Department of Transportation, but it's coming through probably the state or county funds of, of their their like like the Virginia um, Department of, of of Transportation or something like VDOT, right? So mm -hmm. some of that's hybrid money instead of just coming directly from like the the larger agencies. So right. how how do you how do you get your foot in the door? How do you how, how, another question would be is, how, how long did it take you to break into some of these markets? Well, uh, I'll try that first is, uh, I would say like uh, you always go with things like you are most familiar with. So I started uh, as, uh, you know, from a project that I've been doing with VDOT for a long time. So they know me and uh, this is the area that I'm, I have the most knowledge, you know. Uh, also, it's very easy for me to, to know how they do business, how the process is. So that's how I started. So I feel like uh, if I started with the DOD or, or with census, like uh, I didn't really know that you know, climb well. It or took me a lot of time, you know, you know, initial learning curve to overcome that and get to know the process. So I would also always say like, okay, you start with something you really familiar, almost like something you had already been doing. Bobby, any comments? Yeah, so I'll tell you what not to do. And then I'll tell you how <laughs> long, way later what to do. So we start, I, I didn't, like that. <laughs> we didn't come from money, right? And I wanted to start a business and I had a partner with me who was a professor at Virginia Tech and he didn't come from money either. So we wrote one of our first SBIR grant, the Small Business Innovative Research Grant, which is basically if you don't use VC money, the government gives you these grants, which are 100,000 in phase one, to propose a proof of concept. And then if you if they like it, then you get a million or a million and a half to kind of play it out. And that's phase two. And then in phase three, you transition it. The, the way it works is though, it takes six months for a topic to come out. Then they allow you six months to write a proposal and you bid on it. Then you work on your phase one for a year. And then you get a phase two, which is two years. So you already, from the time the need was there to the time you delivered, it was four years. And there's a big chasm because that need is no longer there. It's great because we grew Harmonia doing that. We've done 90 plus SBIR. So we kind of seed capital uh, the, the company, but it took me 10 years. And then finally, when I was in the DC market, I moved myself out of Blacksburg where we started into the DC market. I heard about services contract. Boom, you write a contract, you win it and you're working it. You know, it's instant, right? So for a company which started in 2004, and now it's 2020, I am behind the curve a little because I took so much time in the cyber circuit, right? It's good if I just wanted to make innovation and not worry about really 
creating growth. That's a great model. But I wanted to make Harmonia, a, you know, service a lot of agencies and make it bigger. And that was a slow path for me. So in hindsight, if I was to advise companies who wanted to be federal contractors, and that's a great business plan because you can deliver technologies, the government is a good paymaster, they never default on payments, and you can really make a nice company and then exit it if you are so lucky to do it. But the best way to do it, if somebody was coming in to me today to say, I want to be a federal contractor, I would say, go become a subcontractor to a company which has a contract, right? Because if you're starting off, you're probably small enough to get either an ATA certification or a small woman-owned business or a minority certification or a hub zone. There's so many of this social economic statuses you can get, which larger companies don't have. And they're looking for smaller companies to fill those quotas, so to say. If you become a subcontractor, you get a past performance. The only way to win a contract in federal government is to have three past performances. So you take your first two, three years, build your past performance, and then you bid as a prime, still protected by your socioeconomic status. Because if you're 8A, the government gives you a 10-year run, and now I think it's extended. Uh, and you win almost without competition, but you must have that past performance, right? That's a way, so in five years, you're already, five years that is half of your 10 year cycle, you've already established yourself, you're working as a prime and you can use the next five years to really grow your business and probably before you leave an eight day exit. So that's what I would advise today. Yeah, Any comments, Ken? I would agree with, uh, with everything that uh, folks said. I mean, subcontracting is the way to go um, for sure. Um, that, that's how you basically break in. I think there's two things that I would say is, you know, one, you know, as, as Zongwei had mentioned, like you have to know what your expertise is, right? You have to have a value that you can provide that is unique. You know what I mean? So stay within your swim lane and subject matter expertise, right? You got a network like this harder these days. So if there's anything that I think has hurt us as a company, it has been the ability to kind of network because of any industry, you know, government contracting is still very much a high touch kind of sales mechanism, right? I can tell you on our commercial side, we'll get deals just straight through the website. Like people will come in, they research, they fill out the contact form, our sales reps call out, you know what I mean? Like that doesn't happen in the government. Government is very fury oriented and they want to know right? It takes you like six, 12, 18 months from that initial contract for them to feel comfortable. Like, okay, I can, I can trust these people, right? Like you have to establish that relationship and they have to get to know you or whatever. So networking, once again, I think is also very important, right? And as you develop those relationships and that, you know, so in this particular situation, like if I meet somebody at a networking event, you're a small business, you're interested in getting into government contracting, your expertise is on the, you know, we're data scientists or like uh, I am expertise in like whatever, um, you know, tax regulation or like blockchain or whatever it is, right? Then eventually like, you know, we get to know each other, understand blah, blah, blah. And then a requirement will come up and I'll be like, oh crap, I need this person, right? And then I call you up and I say, hey, you know, can you help us fill this role? Because my company doesn't have that expertise, right? Mm -hmm. So an interesting thing, we had been talking to, you know, a lot of commercial, larger commercial companies and stuff like that or whatever. And it's interesting because on the commercial side, there's not as much partnering going on, right? There's not this kind of concept of like prime subcontractor, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Usually it's like, oh, hey, you know, I'm going to go bid on this Marriott deal, or I'm going to go bid on this AER, you know what I mean? And there's not like this whole, like, Hey, here's the whole team, right? Like it's very rare, maybe two or three on the government side, everybody's frenemies, right? It's all, all co-opetition. Like one day I may be competing against Songwei. The other day we'll team together and go after an opportunity together. It's not that, you know, like almost everything requires it, especially if you're a small business right? Almost everything requires a team. So that I would, you know, basically lean towards that network, have your expertise, get a subcontract. And then once you have a subcontract, then you get the past performance, you get customer relationships, and then you start going after opportunities yourself. Are there any good 
sort of a segue into that is, are there any good lessons learned or takeaways on, I now won the contract, how do I keep and maintain that contract and keep my relationships going? I can take a shot at that. So what I used to hear when I was a very smaller company, you know, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd meet everybody, the contracting officer, the technical monitors, all the stakeholders. And often you'd overhear conversations at a larger company saying, this isn't in my scope of work, so I'm not going to do it. And they feel they're kind of stuck, right? And there's um, some resentment there. Or there's so much copyright stuff that we can't leave this large company because we're tied into uh, so much investment made. So from hearing all that, what I learned was one, be flexible. I never tell a customer, this is not in my scope of work. Ultimately, they'll pay you for the hours, especially in the federal government. Whatever hours you put in, they will pay you. So why stick to your gun and say, this was spent in the paper two years back or three years back, so I'm not gonna do it today, issue me a new contract. They don't want it, it needs change. It's a dynamic world. So being flexible keeps you in because you, on the, when you win a contract, it's no longer about that contract. It's winning that rebit because the rebit will come in three or five years. So you're working that contract from the end to win the rebit. That has to be your mantra every day and your team has to know that, right? So one is the flexibility and one, everything we do is open source. If we make it open source and we empower our government, then they won't be scared of working with us again. So I really believe the more you empower your customer, the more they rely on you because you make them look good without holding them to a gun. And that is the only way to win, win a recompete. And besides the networking, you've got to be on the radar. You cannot let them forget you. Uh, even as the CEO, every day, every week in this pandemic has been what, uh, since March, right? Every week I have written a status report and I don't have to because I have a program manager who has a deputy program manager who has maybe five project managers under them. But every key customer of mine gets a status email from me on every Friday because I don't want them to forget me. This, that's the only thing I can do. It's networking, being flexible and keeping not, not making them hostage to anything copyright. Um. So I'll have a story here. So uh, when I started a consulting job, uh, almost like uh, how many years, 20 years, you know. So, you know, I graduated with a PhD, you know, you know, PhD likes to do research. You close the door, you come up with a you know, fancy solution. So that's how I approached my first job is, you know, like, uh, I think I can really came up with a sophisticated solution for that. So I closed the door, work out the solution. And uh, it ended up like the client didn't know really understand that. And uh, they don't really need that complicated solution. They just need a very simple solution that really solved their need. So that was a really a good lesson for me as an entry level consultant is it's different from the research in the university. When you do a service with a client, the client, their needs is the central point here. You have to come up to understand why they need that, you know, your service here, what they are really pinpoint here. Then you come up with a solution, even just a simple solution, but as long as you can solve their, uh, meet their needs. And then, you know, this is the most, probably the best solution you can give them. So it's always, a, you know, from my career, it's always a centered around the client, is in what they need. That's how you come, you know, maintain and you provide the value of your service there. You are not just give them a solution on the paper, you are really helping them solve problems, you know, in their life, in their business. That's why they hire you here. So that's my really, the, you know, probably the biggest lesson I learned in like from my career. And of course is, you know, we pay a lot of attention to the quality of our work. If they pay you, they pay you hours, and, uh, you know, the quality is just the, the a very key, you know, value aspect. You deliver your work to the client. They have to feel this is the work they can use. It. They can help solve their problems. So I would say this is my lesson learned to help maintain a good relationship with the client. And that's the foundation also for you to continue serving the client and the customers. Yeah, I mean, I think that's basically it. You have to form a partnership. You have to add value. You know what I mean? And so just winning the contract, uh, you have to level up for the next one because 
you know, like everybody wants to steal that contract away from you. <laughs> and I, I hate to put it that way, because like I said, I mean, it's a co-op petition. So there's been obviously plenty of deals that we've lost that have gone to like, you know, our friends. So we're very happy for them or whatever. Like we bid against each other. You guys won. That's cool, right? It's better that it goes to a friend than, you know what I mean? Kind of like, and all that kind of stuff or whatever. Um, but yeah, no, you have to demonstrate your value, right? And that means that you truly have to partner with your customer. So what I would say is like, you know, if you really want to do that, what we try to push, you know, our, our project folks to do is understand their mission, right? Like it's don't, don't be an order taker where it's just like, you know, you go into the client each day and you're like, oh, okay, what do we need for this? You know what I mean? Like become a partner with them understand their mission, understand what they're, you know what I mean? And truly become a team player. And, you know, cause they're, they're hiring us for our expertise, right? They're not, if they knew what to do specifically, then, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily be hiring us. So if they're hiring us for our expertise, how do we fully understand? So as opposed to being like, Hey, we know how to build websites or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, do I really understand the mission of the, you know, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulation Commission? You know what I mean? Like, do I really understand, you know, how Medicaid works, right? And and what is the like path of, you know, saving them costs and how can they use technology to do that, right? Um, so that's what you, that's that's where you have to level in. Right. You have to really understand your customer's mission and help them achieve that. And when you do that, right, when you make them look good and they save money or they serve better customers and all this kind of stuff or whatever, then then you can't then you're unbeatable. Right. Then you have so much barrier to entry because nobody nobody has that level of intimacy that you do. You know what I mean? So anyway, but it's hard to get there. You have to get there. So we have about 15 minutes left. I'm going to get ready to open it up for people to ask questions. But I did have one last thought, and that is I know a lot of you, I mean, you guys all know each other. You're all part of the board of the Asian American Chamber of Commerce. You're all big award winners. You've, 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 you've had your successes, your failures, your growth, and all that wonderful stuff. What, what, are the, what are, one, the resources that you've used? And I know that you're all involved in different organizations how, how do you, why, why those organizations and how do you balance it? While I'm asking it and you're answering, I'm gonna unmute everyone. So um, if they have follow on questions, they'll be able to go as well. So let me start with that. Let's take an organization like ASCC. We all sit on the board and like uh, Ken said, right? We all need to network, right? So on these boards, I sit on the board of three organizations, our peers that I might be teaming with Nobody's going to team with me if I cold call them. I think relationships have to be built when there is no need on the table. Once you have. Oops. Hang on. I have to unmute you. Sorry, Pablo, can you unmute yourself? So how much did you, you hear? Let's start from the beginning. Beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, sorry. So I think I, I serve like many of you on the call, right on the board of AACC and I serve on three other boards. And the reason I do that is because these are people who are my peers. And like Ken said, you have to team. In our space as a federal contractor, it's all about teaming because you can't be everything to that RFP, the request for proposal that comes out. You need to augment your core skill set with other skills that are needed to create a winning proposal. Now, historically, nobody will team with a complete stranger, even with a gardener. You know, if you hire a gardener, if you know somebody who knows that gardener, if there's a relationship there, it's easy to do business with that person. So when we serve on boards like AACC and we make a friendship when there's no need, then when there's a need and I ask, let's say Ken to team with me, he'll be comfortable teaming with me. There's a relationship we've built, which is not built on an ask, it's built on a common interest that we share. So building that ecosystem of peers who you can work with and leverage and reach out to for teaming or help or advice, or maybe I can ask Ken to introduce me to somebody he has on LinkedIn, right? And I'm trying to partner with that. If I just send a blind cold LinkedIn request, most probably that person won't accept it. But whereas to my peers, if I reach out, it increases my entire networking reach. 
Hence, organizations like AACC become really critical for business leaders to, you know, to network at, to be involved in. The other part of organizations like AACC is you give back, right? We'll do causes, social causes, which all of us, all I think it's a human need to give back. Even if we are a taxi driver not making much or a restaurant owner who's really struggling, I think we all have that inert need to give back and help somebody because it makes us feel good. And AACC allows me a platform with my peers to give back. So it makes me feel good, makes me feel socially responsible and creates a special bonding with my peers on the board as we give back together. So hence the value there. I want to say like, I really echo, you know, um, Bobby's two points is that, you know, I really like the words you call, this is the new word I wrote down called echo teaming system. It's really like, the, you know, you, you know, you build a relationship, you may not have a team, you know, you know, every contract, but you never know down the road that you may think about something, you will ask for something, you know. Um, so uh, I think the networking is very, very critical is, uh, you know, you cannot wait until you have a contract, you say, oh, I need to network, mm -hmm. you know. You have to really have the resource there. You can, you know, pick the phone, you can check, hey, do you have someone in that, you know, kind of expertise area. The other one is, you know, the give back is certainly, you know, you know, you, when you look back, you always like a lot of people helped you, you know, during your growth. And they, so don't forget to give back to the community, you know, help other small things. So I really, you know, echo these two points. The other one, I want, the only thing, the other one I want to add is uh, those organizations like the ACC also give you a lot of resources, you know, you can have access to it. You know, I was on a couple of Chamber of Commerce, one of them is the Resident Chamber of Commerce and also this AACC. It's a, as a Chamber of Commerce, it gives you a lot of resource and a connection, um, like how you do business with government, you know, uh, how, you, how you get to know all the, you know, the rules and the regulations, you know. So those Chamber of Commerce organization, you know, they have all these events that you can have, you know, uh, you can tap into it and, uh, and it's very critical, especially for you know small business like us. Is that you always have issues here and there. You know you are not sure, and uh, and you want to really you know get reliable you know advice on those critical items. So the chamber of commerce really is still a very critical you know aspect in those you know areas. Okay. So my my two cents on this is that um, you know I think. And I, I think the other panelists will agree with me. You're going to find out, like as you as you enter into the government contracting space or whatever. DC is a very small town. Mm -hmm. It's 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 amazing how small the community is and everybody that knows any, everybody and all this kind of stuff. Once you get embedded into it, but you do have to do the networking and all that kind of stuff. And as somebody had mentioned in the chat, I mean that's that's become. It, much much harder right during during the covid times like I, I i was the expert at going to networking events to serendipitously bump into somebody that i needed to meet right <laughs> and and you can't do that anymore um so to some extent obviously you have to pick you know an organization you know like an aacc um i can tell you like um other ones that are good are afcia Act, I act, CCAP. There's a gazillion of them, you know, all the chain, like, you know, um, but when you pick an organization, because DC is such a small town and government contracting is so relationship driven, plan to go deep. Do you know what I mean? Um, because once again, it's a trust game. So people that are going to team with you, that are going to give you your first subcontract and all that kind of stuff are going to be people that have known you for a while. And unfortunately, you know, you have to, you have to plan for that. Like it may take six months, right. For that opportunity to come up. But if you're going regularly to the thing and you're seeing that, and you get, you know, and you develop a personal relationship and have conversations and all that kind of stuff or whatever, then, then it will happen. Right. You can't go to a networking event and then say, Hey, that didn't work. Like I went there, I didn't get an opportunity. Right. So the more that you can get involved, and I think that that's why, you know, everybody here is involved, you know, at a deeper level with AACC and other organizations is because we do want to develop those deep, you know, networking relationships. And I can tell you that I've done business with, 
you know, a number of AACC members over the course of, you know, my three year involvement here, like we, we partner on stuff. Um, and I have, I have one opportunities together. So, but, but you have to, you have to cultivate that, that relationship. Right. So, so I think it's not as like, my, my big thing is that, you know, it's not as much about necessarily the organization. Obviously you want to pick one. Um, it's, it's what can you, how do you get involved in that? Can you be on a committee? Can you be on a, you know what I mean? Such that you can develop these relationships because ultimately then, you know what I mean? Like anybody in AACC, more than happy, give me a call. I'll make an intro if I have, you know, contacts or like pass on a business thing or whatever that may be. Um, but you do have to get yourself involved regularly in an, in an organization. I think for the audience, you can click unmute and possibly your video and you'll be able to pop on the screen and ask a question if you like. We have a couple of minutes left if you have any questions. I know Susan, you had a question that you typed in the chat. Yeah, for Susan, I would say that um, GS12, 13 staff, you're right. So those are the up and comers. I mean, um, there's a Fed 100 list that you can look at of like the up and coming Gov people. There are other organizations that I know, like Stan is very um, uh, aware of as well. Ajin in particular is the Asian American Government Executive Network, something Executive like that. Executive Network. Um, that is all like GS 12, 13 staff and how they train to move up. Stan, actually, you can probably give more information on that. There's also, there's also FAPAC, which covers all the grades and they're looking at career advancement as well. Um, but yeah, as far as de definitely the, um, like I mentioned, the, the networking opportunities to bump into some of these people have been become much more difficult, right? Um, and so I have been attending, you know, government contracting happy hours or networking events where they do breakout rooms or whatever in order to keep some of that traction. It's not the same as being able to go to a physical event and, and work a room per se, you know what I mean? But it's all we got. Right. So you have to hop onto these Zoom things and they have their little breakout rooms and you introduce yourselves to people and you get to know them. Same sort of thing, though, like you got to go regularly. Right. So one of the agencies that we're looking at is uh, CMS. Right. Um, because they have a lot of agile DevSecOps contracts or whatever. Like there is a monthly happy hour, you know, and you just. Oh, go, I was go. not aware of that. OK, I'll definitely take a look at that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. G2 Exchange. I'll send you. Um, I'll send you the uh, the uh, email distro to get on or whatever. Oh, great! Uh, yeah, I'm I'm actually um I am preparing a sources sought for CMS. So are you? Um, that'd be great too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, we should we should definitely chat. Yeah, there's uh, Shelly McGuire from G2 Exchange. They got bought by Mile Marker Ten or whatever. She organizes a monthly meeting with Anita Allen, who is the contracting. Uh, person over, that oversees like CMS and I think a couple NIH. Um, so it's usually an HHS type ish focus. Mm -hmm. um, but every month they have usually some session and then there's happy hour uh, things that go on or whatever. Oh. Now it's harder because the happy hour is basically what they do is they have four sessions of networking, right? Mm -hmm. So you come in. They do, do a little presentation, update on, you know, whatever contract, upcoming contract things. And then they'll break out four times, 10 minute sessions, you know, and you get put into a room with anywhere between, you know, four to eight people. Right. But it's all random. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, but it's the same right. thing. Like after a couple of months, you're like, hey, we met last time, you know what I mean? And then right. you, trade, you trade business intel or whatever. Sure. Okay. Yeah. It's a long game. I get it. <laughs> okay. It sounds great. No, I, I really appreciate that feedback. And I hopefully you won't mind if I, um, I, I reconnect with you about CMS. Yeah, possible. absolutely. Send me, I'm going to put my email in the chat for everyone. Okay. okay yeah. I, I've already looked you up on LinkedIn. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I've, I've always looked at the federal marketplace as the long game. I mean, your marketing today will bring in results next year. If you're looking mm -hmm. for immediate results, it's only because you hit the agency at that right moment 
and they needed money to spend like the end of the fiscal year or something like that. But traditionally you're, you're looking at marketing for, for the long period of time. So yeah. you're not going to just go out there and say, Hey, here I am. And they're going to go, great. We've been looking for you unless you absolutely have that, 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 that fix that they absolutely needed. Mm -hmm. I've only seen that happen a few times. Anybody else have any other questions or comments? I just have a quick question for any one of the panel, because um, I'm the supplier diversity liaison for PNC, and I wanted to to hear from our panel about their uh, diversity and inclusion program, um, and also if you are uh, looking for a supplier for your own company, where do you source them out and where do you find them? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I mean, I, I'm happy to say that we've. Um, you know, a number of years in a row, I've been, you know, like we, we usually do a, a survey and we've got rated as like one of the best, um, you know, uh, diversity. And it, it's not, honestly, it's not because we target that or anything as a small company, right? I mean, we're only maybe 150, 160 people. Um, it's just, that's how it turned out, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so I think we're lucky in that regard that we've had some, you know, supplier diversity. Um, I mean, uh, um, diversity within our, our company, company, just, just serendipitously from, you know, the hiring practices. And I think it's just because, you know, as a young agile, you know, kind of lean company or whatever there has, you know, everybody likes the diversity of ideas and, and that sort of thing or whatever. It's a very creative company. Right. So I think that that, yeah. uh, comes into play. From a supplier's perspective, I can't I can't say that we really I guess I guess we're again a small business, so it's really right. based upon on need. It's not as much around supplier diversity per se. Um, unless unless you have a project that needed some actual supplies or manufacturer or something, you know, um, that but it's you your right. supplier really well, limited. Okay. Office so Depot would be the only one. <laughs> So, so, okay. On, on the flip side. Yes. I mean, as, so, so we, we are, I mean, as I'm sure Pallavi is, is, is um, you know, we are at that transition point where we are starting to move after some full and open and especially on state bids. Um, there is a, you know, we, we have partnered obviously because there is a, a minority requirement or a locality requirement or something like that. So in those cases, you know, we will go through like, oh, in, you know, Baltimore or whatever, these are the minority businesses that, you know what I mean, qualify for, qualify them, for whatever it. and contact them and bring them into the fold. Um, so we have definitely done a little bit of that, but it's very targeted, you know, opportunity by opportunity. I think because we're still a very small business, so we don't have anything formal. Yeah, I to respect, I also... just to respect everybody's time, we did hit the mark oh. of what this conference was supposed to go on for. But if you want to stay on, I don't think we have an issue if, if the speakers want to stay on. And Pavit, sorry for cutting you off. Go yeah. ahead and say what you were going to say. I was just saying, I agree with Ken. We, we are invariably diverse, but not because we go after it. You know, do you just go after the talent pool that you're needed? And it just so happens that we meet all the diversity numbers, not that any of our contracts mandate it. I think in the IT world, it just happens by default. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll, Any other questions, I'll comments? One quick comment. Yeah. Um, you know, our company, small business. Uh, so diversity is, uh, you know, really, you know, like a, most a lot of different thoughts, different ideas. So we enjoy that and we like that. All right. I just want to thank our, our panelists for being a part of this this uh, chat, informal chat. Thank you all for attending um, and taking time out of your day because uh, there's a lot of other things you could have been doing instead of being here with us. So I appreciate that. Look at uh, the Asian Chamber of Commerce for future uh, events coming up. Um, become a member, become a sponsor and get involved. <laughs>